they gave me a lot of water. Yeah, that's to make sure that this is not a dry talk. Uh, I made an amazing discovery. I discovered that when I was born that I was black. And when I uh, grew up, I realized that I was still black. When I went out into the sun, the only thing that happened is I got blacker. <laughs> when I got sick, I was still black. And uh, if I were a gambling man, I would bet that when I die, I'm still, I'm still going to be black. But because of my heart for reconciliation, I did a little research on you folk of the light of hue. When I say light of hue, I'm talking about white folks. <laughs> Darker hue is everybody else. See, I discovered when you were born that you were pink. <laughs> and then when you grew up, you became white. When you go out into the sun, you turn red. <laughs> when you go into the very frigid weather, they tell me you look at each other and say you're looking a little blue. I understand that when you're sick, you turn green. And I'm, I'm told that when you die, that you're going to be purple. Now, can I tell you that's okay with me? But I do have a question to ask. How come you folks always call me colored? <laughs> <laughs> Things are not always the way they appear. Sometimes things look one way and, and they are different. Uh, I, I want to deal tonight with the subject of justice and righteousness in the heart of God. I want to deal with it from the standpoint that I believe that the church is divided racially, denominationally, class, gender, that there's division in the church. And I want to understand that division, and I believe there's an answer to address this division, and then we're going to look at some principles uh, that will get us there. Father, as we speak now, we pray that you would indeed superintend this time. Speak in and through me. Let me decrease so that you and the power of your spirit might increase, so these I people would indeed be touched and change and not leave here the way they came. And I pray this in the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. The condition of the church today is best described by saying that the church is wobbly. I, don't, I wonder if you know that only 1% of churches are growing. Now, if you understand that, that means 99% of churches are not growing. 54% of Christian marriages right now are ending up in divorce. That's higher than the divorce rate of those who do not claim to be Christians. What an indictment it is on the church of Jesus Christ. Nine out of every ten pastors is discouraged, very discouraged, and if he had his choice, he would do something other than pastor. If you were born between the year 77 and 94, there's only a 4% chance that you're Christian. Only 4% of the next generation are Christians. That's the lowest percentage rate that... Uh, uh, anyone has known since any sort of statistics have been kept with regard to uh, salvation within a generation. The church is indeed wobbling. Uh, subsequent to 9-1-1, September the 11th, and this was up at least up until two months ago, in Detroit City, every two weeks, a Protestant church closed and a mosque opened. The church is wobbly and it's divided. So the question is, uh, what's the answer? I think there's a breach in the church. 
And I would define that breach as fundamental. It has, I think, even more impetus than the outgrowth of those, this breach, which involves race and denomination. I think the fundamental breach is a breach between justice and righteousness. When I use the term justice, I define it by saying see the need in others and doing something about it. If you look at the theological definition for righteousness, it contains in its definition the definition for justice. If you look at the theological definition for justice, it contains in its definition the definition for righteousness. So they're, inter they're interchangeable and, and they're inseparable. Yet within the church of Jesus Christ, we've managed to separate the two of them. First John chapter 1 verse 9 in my New American Standard that I use says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If you read the, new, uh, the, uh, the NIV, it says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So, so there's an interchangeable, but yet it's there. Now what is this thing? See, there's one segment of the church, oftentimes, it's the suburban church uh, that focuses on righteousness to the exclusion of dealing with issues of justice. Then there's another segment of the church, oftentimes the urban church, that focuses on issues of justice, poor, the oppressive, needy, and oftentimes to the diminished emphasis on righteousness. We see there's a blind spot because only each of them only have half of it. And God, you can't separate justice and righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24 says, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows me and understands me, the one true God, that I am a God of loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. So even God himself gives a, a definition of who he is as a God of justice and a God of, of righteousness. Well, what about the New Testament? In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus uh, started his ministry, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to set free those who are downtrodden, to remove the yoke from the captive, Lift up the captives. Uh, Jesus is saying, uh, my ministry is about the gospel to the poor righteousness and everything else seems to deal with issues of justice. Matthew chapter 11 verse 5, John the Baptist was about to lose his head and he, he realized that. And so he said to his disciples, listen, I'm about to lose my head and so I, I want you to go find out if Jesus is the man. See, I, I want my head to be lost for the right person. So his disciples went to Jesus and said, Jesus, John wants to know, are you the sent one? Are you the Messiah? He didn't say to his disciples, yes, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one. He said, you go back and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to him. He's saying that what my ministry is about is a definition of who God described himself in Jeremiah 9, justice and righteousness. Well, what is it about this breach in the church that, that, that's uh, existed? The people who are on each side of that breach don't realize it. And I think they don't realize it because of blind spots. You know what a blind spot is? Uh, that, that's, that, that means you don't know what you don't know. A blind spot is, is something that you are not aware of, something that, that affects the way you think, the way you see, the way you act, and what you do, but, but you are not really aware of it. It's a blind spot. Ezekiel 16.49 says this. This is the sin of Sodom. See, it wasn't about homosexuality and immorality. It was out of He said, this is the sin of Sodom. They were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned about the poor and the needy. Arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned about the poor, the oppressed, and the needy. Now, if you talk with 
an inner city urban pastor, and you ask that inner city urban pastor, what do you think about the suburban church? He'd say they're arrogant, <laughs> overfed, and unconcerned because my plight is about the poor, the oppressed, and the needy, and I live that day to day. Well, you see, this is my belief. I don't believe that the urban church <laughs> is really unconcerned. I really think they have a heart for the plight, but because of a blind spot, there are things they don't understand and things they don't see. Now, what's the answer to it? The answer to it is in a simple single word. And that single word would be relationship. The answer is relationship. You know what the answer is in the Middle East? <laughs> Between Israel and Palestine? Simple. They don't have relationship. Colin Powell went to try to negotiate peace. He comes back and... And, and some are calling the mission a failure or he didn't succeed in what he wanted and that was a ceasefire. Why, he couldn't get relationship. Now, there are probably a thousand reasons why, but the bottom line is that they have no relationship. So what's the answer to the breach in the church? Not only justice and righteousness, but black and white and brown and red and yellow. It's relationship. You know something that just really struck me about the gospel choir. Uh, did you notice the different faces in that choir? I mean, what a diverse group. When I, when I heard the word gospel choir, I said, hey, I, I'm, I'm expecting to go hear all black folks. And man, I'm looking at this choir, and I'm seeing Asian and white folks, and, uh, and, 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 and boy, that, that little Asian sister that was right over there, boy, she was getting down, I tell you. Uh, Bless my soul. Relationship. I want to give you this first. There are four levels to relationship. And this is critical. Four levels to relationship because most people don't, don't understand. Level one in a relationship, an interpersonal relationship, whether it's man to man, woman to woman, cross gender, Cross race, roommates. First level is acquaintance. You introduce, you get to know one another. Level two is that there's some growth and depth to that relationship. Then level three is there's now confidence and trust is built. And generally, good relationships stop right there, but that's not the most important level. There's a fourth level. And that fourth level is intimacy. I like to call it intimacy. That's a place where there is complete transparency in the relationship, where absolutely nothing is held back. Uh, let's look at those four levels uh, as in terms of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Uh, you're introduced to Jesus. Somebody tells you about him. That's acquaintance, level one. Then you begin to study about him. That's level two. There's some growth and depth. And all of a sudden you realize that he's a savior and you can't get anywhere without him. So you give your life to him. And so therefore you put your confidence and trust in Jesus Christ. Make a vow. That's level three. And, and, and th there it is. It's good, but that's still not enough. If you really want to have a vibrant walk with Christ, you want to get to level four. Intimacy. Level four is when you learn to go into the Holy of Holies. Level four is when you get up 4 a.m. in the morning and you can't wait to spend time in prayer with your Lord and Savior because he's that, he means that much to you. A deep level, level four. Let's look at husband and wife, these four levels. Uh, they meet each other, that's acquaintance. They start dating. There's growth and depth in the relationship. Boy, he pops the question, she says yes. Then there's marriage, that's level three. Confidence, trust, and they make vows. But that's not enough. If that marriage is going to be vibrant and successful and joyful and survive, they got to get to level four. Intimacy, where there's total transparency. My wife has a very, very good friend uh, uh, who's been married 
now uh, 28 years. And a couple of three years ago, she told my wife that uh, when she got married, she told her husband that she was a virgin and she was not a virgin. They've been married 28 years. Her husband still believes that. And my wife knows different. See, see that marriage is at level three <laughs> uh, because there is, uh, uh, she, she's not really been totally, completely transparent, truthful, and honest. And for a marriage to have everything that it de deserves, that's where you have to go, level four. Let me tell you this, and then I want to get into some principles. Uh, it, it is rare, very, very rare, that in a cross-racial relationship that they reach level four. Very, very rare. There are folks who have a cross-racial relationship and say, man, it's wonderful and it's great, but it's, but, but it's not at level four. Now, now, the white person, the lighter hue person, believes that this is a wonderful relationship and will might tell you this is a level four relationship. But talk to the person of color in that relationship. They tell you, no, it's not there. See, to get a relationship to level four, the person of color has to take the person of the lighter hue to Egypt where he or she has never been before. Uh, he has to tell them, he or she has to tell that, that person about the pain that they still feel and, and, and how even with all of, the, of the, the, the freedoms that exist now, there are still regular and frequent occasions in which that person of color is reminded that they are a person of color and it makes a difference. And to take a person there, you, you're going to risk the person saying, come on, give me a break. <laughs> Civil Rights Act of 1964, Martin Luther King brought that and said, from that time, everything's been okay. What are you still bellyaching about? And that's the reason why that person of color won't take you there. <laughs> because that attitude is there. I want to unveil quickly eight principles that's designed to get you to level four. Why is level four important? It will build a breach in the church. Why is level four important? If you get to level four across racial lines, a, a lot of the issues and strife that exist will be going. If you get into a level four relationship with your wife, we won't have 54% of Christian marriages breaking, uh, breaking up. If you get into a level four relationship, parents with children, we won't have the problem that we have right now where we've really lost this next generation. So how do we get to level four relationship and that's key? Uh, there are eight biblical principles uh, that I want to unveil for you uh, that'll get us to a level four relationship. I don't need this one because it says that. Principle number one it's called the principle of call. Ha, worked. Uh, the principle of call. We all call to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation, but some of us have a special calling to, to minister in diverse circumstances. Now, the key word here is mandatory. Scripture is second. Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, 21. Verse 17 says, Anybody in Christ is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Then the very next verse says, And to the new creation, you've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 says, This reconciliation uh, is based on really the principle that we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and we love our neighbors, ourselves. So the first principle that we understand is that if we are part of verse 17, which is the new creation, then we our first and most important and overriding assignment is that we are given the ministry of reconciliation. So the issue is that it's mandatory. Look at principle number two, and this is key. 
Commitment to relationship. Reconciliation is built on the foundation of committed relationships. That's the foundation. Now the key issue is conflict resolution. You see, into every relationship, <laughs> conflict will come. Into every relationship, conflict will come. How often will we have conflict in marriage? Until Jesus returns. So what do you do when conflict comes in marriage? You have to resolve the conflict. So the key issue for is, is being committed to resolve conflict. And, and Ruth chapter 1 verse 16 and the first part of 17 Ruth says to Naomi, do not urge me to leave you to return from following you. For where you go, I will go where you lodge. I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And then verse 17, the first part says, and where you die, there I will be buried. See, that's a commitment until death to your part. Every marriage that I do, I use that verse because that is a commitment that you make with marriage. So the issue is conflict resolution. Well, in order to resolve conflict, you have to understand that dialogue is necessary. You see, whenever there's a problem between roommates, you know it because they're not talking to one another. Whenever there's a problem between husband and wife, you know it because they're not talking to one another. Between parents and children, they're not talking to one another. The only way you can deal with conflict and resolve conflict you have to enter into dialogue. Rule Howe gave us what's called the miracle of dialogue. It says, every man is a potential adversary, even those whom we love. Only through dialogue are we saved from this enmity toward one another. Di now, this is very important, this phrase. Dialogue is to love what blood is to the body. When the flow of blood stops, guess what? The body dies. But when dialogue stops, love dies and resentment is born. It just doesn't die. Love dies and resentment is born. But dialogue can restore dead relationship. Indeed, this is the miracle of dialogue. It can bring a relationship into being and it can restore again a relationship that has died, died, there's only one qualification to these claims of dialogue. It must be mutual and perceived from both sides, and the parties involved must pursue it relentlessly. Dialogue, the miracle of dialogue. We get involved. If we're going to resolve conflict, we must understand and get involved in dialogue. Let's look at principle number three, intentionality. I call this principle the locomotive. Intentionality is a purposeful, positive, and planned activity that facilitates reconciliation. The key word is perseverance. Ephesians 2.14 says, when Christ went to the cross, said it is finished, it broke down the barrier of the dividing wall of hostility. Broke it down. It was intentional. God became man. It was intentional. Christ went to the cross. It was intentional. He stayed on the cross. It was intentional. And when he rose on the third day, it was also intentional. When he comes back at the sound of the archangel and the trump of God, it will also be intentional. Now, you'll never have a relationship with anyone who is different than you racially, ethnically, if you're not intentional. You have to do some intentional things to, to inspire dialogue. Now, at, at the church that I pastored, I founded and pastored in Chicago, 65% of the church is black, 35% of the church is white. In order to get people in relationship with one another, and we're trying to get level four relationships across racial lines within the church, uh, we used to have a, a formal meeting once a quarter where we would engender issues and dialogue to talk about issues of race. We call that a marathon Sunday. Now, white folks in my church called every Sunday a marathon Sunday. 
Uh, but on this particular Sunday, uh, at 9.30, during, during the Sunday school hour, we would have uh, what we call a chocolate meeting. And we got the chocolate people together in, in the church, and we talked about the church from the black perspective. Then right after church, uh, the chocolate people would go eat, and then we would send the white folks to the chapel, and we'd have what we call a vanilla meeting. Uh, and we would talk about the church from the white perspective. And, and in that meeting, white folks would talk about black folks, and, and in black meeting, black folks talk about white folks. And then we, on that same Sunday, after eating is done, we bring everybody together, and then we'd have what we call a fudge ripple meeting, and I served fudge ripple ice cream and Oreo cookies. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I rat it. I would rat on both groups. I would say to the brothers, y'all won't believe what those white folks said about y'all in the, in the vanilla meeting. Uh, you know how we got things out? We would put them on a three by five card anonymously. It didn't matter who the issue came from. We just wanted to get all of the issues out so we could talk about it. We got dialogue going. So our intentional act to make a difference uh, was to have a purposeful dialogue in which we had the freedom to say exactly what was on our mind. Remember one meeting, a chocolate meeting, one of the chocolate sisters says, Pastor, my mama didn't raise me to hate white folks. I said, that's wonderful. But did your mama raise you to go out of your way to demonstrate active love toward white folks? She said, well, no, she didn't go that far. <laughs> I said, well, I've been searching the Bible looking to find some middle ground between love and hate. Guess what? I couldn't find any. See, either I'm actively expressing love or I'm hating my neighbor because I don't understand my neighbor and I may be injuring my neighbor and not even understand what I'm doing. It's intentionality. Uh, what drives the ministry of reconciliation Intentionality is the two greatest commandments. To love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and then to love your who? Neighbor as yourself. Now, the question is, who is your neighbor? Uh, anybody that you come across during any walk in time of your life, anytime you're in proximity with anyone who has a need that you can satisfy, issue of justice, that person is your neighbor. See, I travel a lot, fly on a lot of planes, and I was saying, you know, what if I end up, you know, so, so the black man's your neighbor, white man's your neighbor, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, they're your neighbor. I travel a lot on an airplane, I said, man, what if I got on an airplane and all of a sudden sitting next to me in the seat is Osama bin Laden. And Osama says, Raleigh, I, I, I'm thirsty. You know what I got to do? I got to give Osama something to drink. Osama says, Raleigh, I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> I, I got to give him something to eat. He says, I'm cold. I, 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 I had to run out of that cave real fast. <laughs> uh, I got to put something on him. Why? Because when I sit on the plane and he's next to me, at that moment, he, he was what? <laughs> he was my neighbor. And my scripture says, I got to love my neighbor as myself. Well, I served 20 years in the military. And uh, if I was in the military now on active duty, and I got on an airplane and I sat next to Osama bin Laden, I would probably choke him. A deacon in the church heard me say that, and he said, but pastor, but what if you were still called to the ministry and you're born again preacher and you're on an active duty in your, in your uniform and you sit next to Osama, what would you do? I said, I would choke him in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and I'm just joking. <laughs> What's the point I'm really trying to make? Is what drives the train of relationship is I love God with all my heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And if I love him with everything, it must be manifest in how I demonstrate that I love my neighbor as myself. Intentionality. Let's look at principle number four. Call it the principle of sincerity. S sincerity is the willingness to be vulnerable including self-disclosure of feelings, attitudes, differences, and perceptions with the goal of resolution and building trust. Notice how that principle relates to 
moving toward level four, intimacy, into me see, huh? reveal myself. Uh, and this principle of sincerity says I got to be willing to be vulnerable and, and, and self-disclose what my feelings, attitude, and differences and perceptions are. The goal of doing that is resolution and building a foundation of trust. See, my attitude, my feeling, my perceptions, none of those may be accurate, but they represent how I think and they drive my train. The key here is trust and transparency. In John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you slave because the slave does not know what the master is doing. I call you friends. For everything that the master has made known to me, I, 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 have, I have made it known to you. I've revealed everything. I held nothing back. Now, now I want to do a, a little t test. You know, back in my church, when people agree with the preacher, they say amen. Can you say amen? Okay, now, but you only say amen when you agree, all right? Gotcha. Okay, now, I, I, I'm going to say something, and if you agree with me, I want you to say amen, okay? Most white people trust most black people implicitly, amen? Let me try it again. Most black people trust most white people implicitly, Amen? Most Asians trust most white people implicitly. Amen. Oh, I got it now. I got it right. Most Native Americans. <laughs> I don't even need to go there, do I? <laughs> Can I tell you what you are agreeing with me with your silence? You're saying this. When we come to the table to one another across racial lines, we bring with us a boatload of mistrust. You know why we, we, you know why we, amen, thank you, brother. You, you know why we have distrust? Because we don't know each other. And we don't know each other because we're not in relationship. And we're not in relationship, so therefore we don't understand each other. And the relationship that we have is a level one or level two relationship. Even sometimes a three when there's no real transparency. Sincerity. Let's look at principle number five. Call it the principle of sensitivity. Sensitivity is the intentional acquisition of knowledge in order to relate empathetically in, in any diverse situation, person, place, or organization. Now the key thing, or the key issue is knowledge and understanding. Ephesians 4.15 says, Speak, speaking the truth in love. Now, now, sensitivity. Gaining knowledge to understand. I'll tell you three words that can help you gain knowledge to relate empathetically with someone who is different, racially different than you. And tell you those three words are, help me understand. Simple word, like help me understand. See, how can you find out what a person's Diet is, if you don't say, help me understand. I can understand what a person likes to eat, not like unless you ask the question. Help me understand. I remember when Glenn K. Ryan, who co-authored the book with me, he's white, and Glenn and his wife, Lonnie, and my wife, Paulette, and I, we were going to Minneapolis, Minnesota to do a weekend conference on reconciliation, and I told the people there, hey, put us in a hotel, two rooms together because, you know, we want to have a little quality time with one another. Well, they didn't put us in a hotel. They put us in a home of a young white couple in the church that, uh, that didn't have any kids but had a real big house. Well, well that, that, that was okay because it was nice. She was a doctor and he was a psychologist and they're wonderful people. I mean, really wonderful. Young white couple, wonderful people, wonderful. But they were health nuts. There was not an ounce of sugar in the house. When we got up to eat that first morning, they lined up cereal for us. Fiber one, fiber two, fiber three. Five. I was dying for some frosted flakes, but there were none to be found. And when we had dinner, they prepared what they call in Minnesota a hot dish. Now in Florida, we call it a casserole. That's where you put everything all in one dish. Well, 
This particular hot dish was loaded with vegetables, and I fished for days to find one piece of meat. <laughs> but that's okay. They're a wonderful couple. Well, on Saturday of that week, the associate pastor of the church, who was an African-American, says, Riley, we're going to have you over to my house for dinner. I said, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> my wife said, what do you mean? I said, man, we're going to have some Leroy. Now, y'all know Leroy, that's fried chicken. Huh? So, so we're going to say, so Paulette said, why do you think that? I said, honey, he knows that I've been suffering. He knows <laughs> that he put me with those health nuts. And so he is going to give me a break on Saturday night, and I'm going to get a little grease. And I know that, honey. I'm looking so we went over to his house that night, wonderful, rang the door buzzer. He said, come on in. Let me introduce you to my wife. And his wife came down the stairs, blonde and blue-eyed. Guess what we had for dinner? <laughs> A hot dish. <laughs> we chuckled throughout the whole meal. Now, I say, I, this is what I did for my church, and I did it on a regular time. I said to the white folks, when the last time y'all had some black folks over for, 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 for dinner? Black folks, when the last time you had some white folks? Quit making excuses, guys, let's do it. Then I tell the white folks, listen, don't make a big issue out of it. We black folks know how to eat, you know, and all of the utensils and all of that, but, but don't go through all of that. When you bring us over, just get a bucket of Kentucky Fried, throw it on a car, say, hey, everybody's relaxed, we can eat. That's what I tell the white folks. You know what I tell the black folks? When you have the white folks over to your house, make sure you've got a lot of carrots and dip. <laughs> you see, we, see, we, we just want to deal with, with, with sensitivity uh, and seeking to understand. Glenn K. Ryan and I, we travel together. And, and uh, we'd stay in people's homes sometime. We'd stay in the hotel. We'd, we'd have the same room. We'd, he'd get up, take a shower. The brother would shampoo his hair every morning. Every morning. Glory, every morning. Listen, <laughs> I, I, I don't shampoo my hair every morning. I don't shampoo my hair every week. And I said, Glenn, help me understand. Why, 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 you, why do you do this every day? You know? He said, well, m my scalp gets oily. And so I have to walk. I say, your scalp gets what? He says, it gets oil. I said, man, I'm looking for all the oil I can get. <laughs> said, my scalp is very dry, so I'm looking for oil. I, I learned a great lesson. Hey, you ever see, see this black sister going around? You don't see it as much, but uh, you see her one day, and her hair is about shoulder length, and she's looking real cool. Then you see her next week, and she's got some kind of rope things, and it's... And, and, and you don't know what it is, because you've never heard of a weave before, you see what I'm saying? Well, well, you know what you should say to that sister? Say, hey, sister, help me understand. <laughs> I, help me explain this, this hairdo change. She's going to do one of two things. She's going to either punch you out. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a relationship with her, she's going to explain to you that it's a weave and it's a style. And, 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 and you'll understand what's going on. See, sensitivity is, is, is you gain knowledge, and the best way to gain cross-cultural knowledge is by simply asking the question, help me understand. Let's look at the next principle. Principle number six is the principle that we call sacrifice. Sacrifice is the willingness to relinquish an established position or status to genuinely adopt a less, lesser position in order to facilitate a diverse relationship. Now, the key issue is cost. So you can't have a relationship with anybody who's different than you without paying a cost. In other words, you can't always have it your way, even with husband and wife, especially with husband and wife. Amen. Amen. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. See, there's a cost to pay. You got you to gotta be willing to give up your right to be right. You got to be willing to give up what you are comfortable with in order to tap in to what's comfortable with someone else. And if you learn how to do that, you know what happens? You become more rich because you really begin to tap into it. I mean, listen, 
That was a gospel choir. And, and I mean, those, those spirituals and gospel songs. And they were clapping and swaying and getting down with it. And everybody in that group that wasn't black was doing it like they was born doing it. Huh? Why? why, why? They, they, they had, they, they'd given up their right to be right. They'd given up their way. They said, okay, teach me how to do this, and I'm going to do it. And they got with it. And each one of them are more rich because of it, because they haven't lost their culture and their style, but they got something else going for themselves. Sacrifice. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, Consider others as just as important as yourself. That's right? Somebody's listening. Consider others as more important than yourself. Consider others. Sacrifice. Principle number seven is the principle of empowerment. A lot of definitions because people use this word in various different ways. Let me tell you how we use it in this case. Empowerment is the use of repentance and forgiveness to create complete freedom in diverse relationships. Key issue is repentance and forgiveness. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says, For this is the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Empowerment. Listen, have you ever been around anyone, mama, daddy, friend, anyone where there was a conflict that was unresolved going on? Wherever that happens, you know what there was? Tension going on. You could sense and feel the tension. But when somebody takes responsibility and says, man, I, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and that person is then forgiven, all of a sudden, the atmosphere changed. Everything is okay again. It changes the entire atmosphere in which you're in. That's empowerment. Your use of forgiveness and, and repentance. Now, why is that so important? Because in relationships, you're going to blow it. You're going to say dumb things. You're going to do dumb things all the time. And if you say something that hurts a person, and that person who's hurt doesn't say anything, I can guarantee you this relationship is nowhere near level four. But if you're in a transparent relationship in level four, and you say something that hurts, say, listen, can I tell you something? You said X, Y, and D, and that hurt me. Let me tell you why that hurt me. Then there's a chance then to repent, and a chance for forgiveness. Then that relationship becomes stronger, and it goes deeper. Principle number eight. This is the capsule. Interdependence. Interdependence recognizes differences and realizes that each offers something to the, that the other needs, resulting in equality in the relationship. Key word is equality. See, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 14 says, My abundance satisfies your want, and your abundance satisfies my want, so that there is equality. You know what God is saying in that scripture? That every one of us has been given an abundance of something from God Almighty. And that unique abundance that you have is different from my unique abundance. And so when you and I are in relationship with each other, and you gain from my abundance, and I gain from your abundance, we both are more rich. And so if we realize that God has given abundance to everyone, we go into a relationship saying, I need you, and I notice you need me. We need each other. Then there's not a paternalistic attitude. You know, when you go in a mission field, missionaries can be very paternalistic. When, 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 when you go to minister in the hood, down in my neighborhood in Chicago, you come there, you say, man, we, we, we're coming here because we have something for you people. Never realizing that we have something for you people. Because there's an abundance that God has given both of us. 
we have to recognize that we need each other. I, I want to sum this up and close it off with, uh, with this story that, uh, that, that I share with the permission of my, uh, my daughter-in-law. My son, Coffee, who is uh, just got promoted to the se as Senior Vice President for Student Affairs at Trinity International University. Boy, he, he's all right. That's my son. He's doing well. But he married one of y'all. Y'all of the light of hue. He married one of y'all. His wife's name is Kenna. That's my daughter-in-law. Kenna. I love Kenna. I mean, I, I, I really love Kenna. But Kenna is like some of y'all. She's very, 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 very structured. Can I get one amen? amen. <laughs> I mean, Kenna is structured. <laughs> Kenna and my son, Coffee, my grandkids, they go to Disney World three times a year. Spend about a, almost a week. I mean, can you imagine a week with Mickey? Yeah, a, a whole week. Um, three, four years ago, maybe four or five years ago, Kenna talked my wife into committing us to a week <laughs> with Mickey. <laughs> and I said, honey, what? she said, honey, and Kenna won't do this. She said, let me tell you something. She says, Kenna, you know how Kenna is? She, she, she wants to plan the vacation. Plan the vacation? So yes, I said, what, what harm can you do? Vac vacation is vacation. You, you come when you want to, go when you want to, no, no problem. So I said, yeah, tell Kenna. I said, she can plan the vacation. She can leave, no problem. Three days later, I got this in the mail from her. <laughs> now, now I, 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 I read this with her permission. As a matter of fact, every time I do this, I have to give her a couple of dollars, you know. It's, Oh, so she really doesn't mind me doing it. She says, hello, everybody. Here's a list of the things we will be bringing on the trip. Hope this helps you with your planning. I've also enclosed a tentative schedule of activities. <laughs> the, act, uh, the schedule includes one, week, uh, one evening in each of the parks, three mornings in Magic Kingdom, two mornings in Epcot, one morning in MGM, and a full day at Universal. Say, so I have arranged to see every parade and fireworks show that is available. <laughs> See, I learned something about folks lie to you. Whatever you pay for, you'll make sure you get everything that you pay for. <laughs> say, uh, say, say, there's time for swimming and free time. He said, yes, an hour and a half. That's all it was. He said, <laughs> say, please note that every person is responsible for leading a short, parentheses remind dad, is to be a short devotional. Says, I apologize that you think this is too structured, but... I, I promise you that you won't miss anything if you follow this. I, pa I passed it by cough, that's my son, but he'll probably deny that he saw it. So get, pl get plenty of rest before the trip. Rachel, that was my oldest daughter, say, you don't want to sleep when you're at Disney. Petra, Naomi wants to be on your team. Kendra wants to be on Rachel's team. We have partners at Disney, so no one gets lost. Says, Mom, that's my wife, I am sending this packing list so you can start putting things into the suitcases now. Don't stay up to 3 a.m. in the morning, please. She knows my wife's habits. She said, Dad, thanks for letting me plan the trip. I appreciate your supportive attitude. Love you guys. Hope you're as excited as we are. Your two guide Kenna. Now, here's a list that she sent. It says, camera film, camera battery, swim, swimsuit, rain gear, sunglasses, airline tickets, universal tickets, wide world tickets, credit cards, waist pouches, makeup, shoes, socks, shirts, short pants, jackets, driver's license. Right, license, hair stuff, socks, shampoo and conditioner, contact lens stuff, underwear, Bible fans, plastic clothes for dirty clothes, plastic clothes for wet clothes. <laughs> Say, uh, uh, mobile phone, phone batteries, change, camcord tapes, camcord batteries, stroller with chains. I mean, is it going to snow at Disney? Huh? <laughs> Say, M MasterCard Club, Sam's Card, AAA, card schedule, can openers, diapers with wipes, sunscreen, and that's got to be for her. I don't need sunscreen. <laughs> Say, Say, razors, electric shave, deodorant, clippers, 
stopwatches, uh, stopwatches, you need that, leashes, <laughs> reservation numbers, drinking cups, backpack, dryers, Naomi's uh, crown bag, and beeper. Now, that was the list. See, you can't see this. I wish I had it on a transparency. I got to put it as much so you can see it. You know what this is? This is an hour by hour <laughs> for every day that we were there. Now, I'm going to give it to you. Let me just tell you, we got there on Friday. L let me read to you Saturday. This, now, don't forget, we're on vacation. Don't forget. 6 a.m., get ready. 6.30, eat. 7 o'clock, uh, drive to Magic Kingdom. 7.30 to 11 o'clock, Magic Kingdom. 11.30, bus to hotel. I mean, when we were going back to the hotel, we saw thousands of people just trying to get in Magic Kingdom. We'd all already been there four hours. <laughs> 12 o'clock, eat. 12.30, devotions. Kenneth, she took the first one and set the 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, swim. 2.30, 2 o'clock to 3.30, free time, an hour and a half, just like I said. <laughs> um, 4 o'clock, bus to Magic Kingdom. 4.30 to 8.30, Magic Kingdom. 9 o'clock, arrive at parade. 9.30, bus to hotel. 10 o'clock, hotel check-in and drop dead. <laughs> what y'all think I did with this? <laughs> Can I tell you? I followed that schedule to the letter. Can I tell you why? Because I love Kenna. You know what happened the first morning? She and my grandbabies came into the room, and Kenna said to me, come on, Dad, where are we going? That's not what she was saying. She was saying, are you really going to let me lead? I said, Kenna, what do you mean? Asking me. I'm not leading this vacation. You're leading the vacation. She lit up like a Christmas tree. We were off and going. Now, uh, you, you remember that stopwatch I'll tell you? We would be in a line ready to get to a ride. Stopwatch would go off. They said, come follow me. Then we'd go to another ride. We'd be first in line. I mean, they had that thing mapped out to the key. When the week was over, we, we were holding hands to pray for a safe journey home. And Kenna said, Dad, wait before you pray. She came over and gave me a real big hug. The tears was coming in her face. She said, Dad, thank you for letting me plan and lead the vacation. See, I gave up my right to be right. I stepped out of my comfort zone so that Kenna could thrive in her comfort zone. I gave up my right to be head of the family and make the decisions. And I became a follower. And what was the end result? Kenna and I, we're in a level four relationship. Uh, we love each other. There's nothing that I wouldn't do for Kenna, and there's nothing that Kenna wouldn't do for me. You know the, the dynamic? There's interdependence. There's the principle of sacrifice. Uh, there was a principle of intentionality. Because Kenna said, I let me plan and lead the vacation. Here's the bottom line, and I'll close with this. There's a breach in the church. There's a breach between races. There's a difficulty that we have in demonstrating to, 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 to the world that, that we are Christians by our love for one another. And why? Because we're not in relationship. And the relationships we have are surface. Level one, level two. Some get the level of Three, you want to see the church of Jesus Christ come alive? You want to see the power of one? You want, you want to answer the John 17 prayer Jesus said, I pray that they would be one? Then get into relationship. Cross colors in relationships and take that relationship to level four. And you know what will happen? <laughs> the church will come together. And other folks and non-Christians and other religions have said, those people got something <laughs> that we need because of the depth of our level for relationships. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Uh, I realize that we are a little bit beyond the time that we were supposed to be. Uh, 
but yet, uh, yet I, I want to at least extend for about five or ten minutes uh, I'm on a, an opportunity for you to fire some questions at me about what I share. Now, now, let me tell you how we could really make this exciting just a minute. Um, when I would open up a question, uh, a question and answer period about relationship and principles, dealing with the issue of relationships and race and issues, for the first year I did this in my church, man, you, you wouldn't believe how everybody loved each other. Nobody had problems. I mean, everything was hunky-dory. I said, something's wrong because I know this is not right. So after a year, God gave me this idea. I passed out th three by five cards. I said, you got any questions or issues <laughs> that have to do with this church and race and other folk? Then write them on the card anonymously. Don't sign it and get it in. And we could never get through the cards <laughs> because of issues and thoughts and ideas that people had. And so um, I don't want to belabor the time, but I, I want to open it up for questions. Or, 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 and, and while somebody is bold enough to answer a question, if you've got a piece of paper, sit back this paper, and you want to write down that real thorny question, <laughs> write it down and, and, and shoot it in. And let's take just a, about 10 minutes or so of dialogue, and I'll try to make my answer succinct, which is difficult for me. Yes, yes, ma'am. Good evening. Oh, okay. <laughs> the questions running through my brain had much to do with mixed race identity, mixed race people. I've had equal rage for both white people and yellow people. Mm -hmm. The rift that you talk about is split right in my body and in my family. Um, there are more complex issues with that. There's not any one home to claim. And in very lucky times, there are both homes to claim. Um, can you speak in any way biblically to something like that, where the issues are not just on the outside, but on the inside? Because that's where we're at in America today. We're in a mixed race America. Thank you very much. Uh, you have raised indeed a, a thorny uh, issue. Uh, what do you call mixed race children? As America is indeed uh, becoming more and more of that fashion, what do you call mixed race children? Um, I don't consider myself uh, an expert as to how to respond to that when it's white and Asian uh, because there are some complex dynamics. But let me give you an answer and try to back it up biblically when the issue is black and white. The advice that I give mixed children of biracial parents, black and white, I give their parents and give them, is to raise that child up to consider his or herself black. Uh, raise that child up to, uh, no matter how, I mean, even if that child is, is, is so white, they can pass. <laughs> raise them up to consider themselves black to the point that they can sing the song like James Brown. You know that song? Say it loud. <laughs> I'm black and I'm proud. Uh, now, why? Because society as a whole is going to consider that child black and is going to treat that child the way a black person is treated. And so what's the issue in having that child embrace that culture? 
is so that that child will not have an identity crisis forced on him or her by society and that child can always stand up and be happy for who they are. In the case of black and white, let's face it and speak open, black is looked at on the lower end of the totem pole. And that's how society looks at it. If that child is as white as white can be and, they've, and, and, and is dating a, a young lady who's white and her, uh, her parents find out that, that the kid is mixed, all kind of things, generally speaking, come out of that circumstance uh, that, uh, that's painful to the child. Now, am I saying that that child should deny his white heritage? Absolutely not. See, between that child and his parents and his family and, and those he loved and close to him, he's mixed and he's respected for being mixed and there's no problem. But you've got to live in society and you've got to deal with the things society is going to throw at you. And so how do you prepare yourself to deal with that and not really be discouraged and, and, and feel beat down because you feel one way and society is not looking at you another way. It, it, it's, it's to embrace the identity uh, that, uh, uh, that, that will give you the greatest sense of confidence and assurance as you uh, matriculate in that society. Uh, I, I saw a program on Oprah Winfrey's show 10 years ago and the audience was filled with mixed uh, uh, offsprings. And, and this is what I noticed in that program. The kids who was them clamoring for society to recognize them as mixed and give them that category were kids who were carrying with them a lot of hurt because they wanted something that was not being given to them. But the kids who had taken one side, there was a kid who he looked really Filipino, but he was Chinese and black, <laughs> uh, and he looked Filipino, and uh, now he looked anything but black. <laughs> uh, but he got up and he says, I'm black, <laughs> and, and he began to talk about that, and he was so confident in his identity, though he didn't look that way. He had chosen that, and he was happy with that, he was content in that, he didn't have an identity crisis. And so the biblical basis I would give you is find your primary identity in Christ. I'm a child of the king. I'm a joint heir of the kingdom of God. Uh, I, I, I will inherit the riches of my father because my identity is in Christ, in Christ alone. But because I live in on this earth, in this earthly flesh, I have a biological heritage, and within that biological heritage, I want to embrace what is going to give me the greatest sense of confidence to deal with the society that I must deal with. And so that's how I would respond to it. Hope I didn't confuse you more. <laughs> Any other questions? It's hard on both sides, and uh, so how? What kind of steps can you take? Little steps that can get can start this process going. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kinney. Um, principle number two is commitment to relationship, and the foundation to reconciliation is relationship. See, my recommendation is before 
You, you start swapping pulpits and choirs and, and having activities. Before you do that, you take some intentional, purposeful, positive, and planned steps to, to engender relationships. Pastor to pastor, elder to elder, deacon to deacon, choir leader to choir leader, and then get uh, members and get uh, enough people uh, who are, are, are willing to ha have some kind of joint gathering in the mix and say the purpose for this, and both preachers line it up, is for us to, to go each other because we got one purpose in mind, one purpose only. We want to try to hook up together as many families as we can to establish relationships. No other purpose, but to establish relationships. Here are the rules for, this, here are the, rules for the relationship. Um, get together for a meal twice a month. Two men in the family, ladies, the ladies have lunch together, have breakfast together, but do it at least twice a month. Plan to spend no more than 45 minutes together, have no agenda for the meeting, but be committed to the meeting. Do nothing. No agenda, no purpose. Just meet. And do this for six months. No other agenda. After you've done that for six months, and let's say that you have 25 families in each congregation being involved with that. Now do something and come together. Completely different dynamic. Because when you come together, you've got people who know each other. They're in relationship. And they're working in that relationship toward level four. They may be at level two or moving toward level three. But they have something in common, something they can talk about. They can't sit there. Why? Because for six months, twice a month, they've had a breakfast or lunch together. And so the relationship is there. See, see to me, it's putting the cart before the horse to do an activity or to do activities and, and there is no relationship. Uh, that has all kind of problems to it. But the key and the foundation, see, the answer is, is so simplistic until it's complex. And that is you have to get into relationship. Take two roommates, many of you are students. What happens if you get with a, a person, a new roommate? Huh? I mean, there's nothing happening between these roommates. <laughs> until they get into a relationship. Uh, I mean, there are roommates who don't eat together, who don't do anything together. Uh, she stays with her crowd, she stays with her crowd. But then after time passed, because they're in the same room, <laughs> they're forced then to start talking, and somewhere down the line, weeks or months, they, the relationship starts. All of a sudden, the whole dynamic changes. The relationship has to come first. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned your your son, uh, Mary Kenna, and Kenna being his father, his wife. Um, I just want to know when, when you found out that your son was seeing Kenna, how do you react? And uh, I guess what steps did your son take to uh, maintain, uh, I guess, your trust in him? And how did he honor you with that? Um, Laura's asking a question about uh, mixed marriage, and, and what, what 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 kind of issues do you face, or what do we face? When, when my son came uh, and brought Kenneth to the house uh, that Christmas and said, Mom and Dad, Ken and I have decided we love each other and we want to get married and we plan to get engaged uh, this coming summer. And we want to get your approval. I listened to them and I said, Son, uh, I can't give you my approval. Because I don't think you and Ken are walking close enough to Jesus to know what Jesus is leading you to do. Now, here's what I want you to do. Convince me that your walk with Christ is serious enough uh, that you're doing what you know Christ is leading you to do because of the depth of your relationship with him. 
They took me my word. Every time the church opened, they were there. And they did this for a good solid six months. Six months they came back to me. Said, Dad, uh, uh, we are now more convinced than ever that Christ is calling us together to be married. Can we get your approval? I said, absolutely. Uh, when they got ready to get married, which was about 18 months after that, they wanted to get married in my church in Chicago, which is a racially mixed church. Ken is from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Ain't no black folks in La Crosse, Wisconsin. <laughs> and I said, no, you're not going to get married at Rock Church because that's skirting the issue. You're going to get married in La Crosse, Wisconsin, in Kenneth's church, and Kenneth's pastor is going to do the vows, and I'll do the wedding homily. And that's what we did. We took a whole busload of black folks to La Crosse. <laughs> Uh, we, had the, we had the wedding uh, on Saturday, and they had a big cake with a black groom and, and a white bride on it, and, and uh, uh, we dealt with things up front and uh, 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 came across. I think, though, Gloria, that had a lot to do with the fact that uh, of, of, of where I, I am dealing with that. Now, uh, you need to know, since you asked the question, her dad did not approve. Her dad did not approve. And um, he came to see me and to tell me that he didn't approve. And, and I said, you got to understand something. Two years before that, he had left Kenna's mom. And he was uh, uh, seeing another lady. And uh, reconciliation was an act. And I, and I said, uh, Mr. Ramsbottom, you need to understand that uh, your relationship with Christ is such that you've disqualified yourself from having uh, a formal say in what's happening. But I want to honor you, and I want to respect you, and so let's dialogue. And he gave me all of his reasons. I shot them all down. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we parted uh, amenably, and uh, it went this way. Um, Kenna told her dad, uh, dad, uh, because, because you refused to listen to the pastor, you left mom, you're with another woman, and, and so you're outside of, of, of Christ, and, and unless you reconcile with mom and get it right, I can't let you walk me down the aisle. And you know how Kenna came down the aisle? She walked down the aisle alone. It, it, was, it was courageous, but man, as I stood there with, with her pastor, seeing her come down the aisle alone, it just broke my heart. But it made me love her all the more because she was committed to doing what she felt was right in the sight of God. Her dad was there, sitting on the fourth row, sitting on the seat. He was there. But she walked down the aisle alone. Um, uh, so... Uh, I, uh, uh, I feel that mixed marriage should not go forth until both have done everything within their power to get parents to respond in a way that's, that, 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 that's right and proper in the sight of God. And spare no rod. If the parents are biblically wrong, give them time. Pray with them. But go after them to get them on board because nothing is, is, is worse for a marriage to start off when you have uh, enmity <laughs> on, on one side of the family. Work hard at making that happen. And I, I think that's, that's the goal. That's what I've always done as pastor, and God has given me favor in seeing that happen. Y'all know Numbers 12? Moses married a Cushite who's an Ethiopian. It says, uh, Aaron and Miriam murmured at Moses because of the Cushite wife. That's Ethiopian. Then it says in parentheses, for he married a Cushite. Now, now why did the Holy Spirit inspire the writer of numbers to, uh, uh, to reiterate that statement? 
because, you know, people wouldn't believe that Moses, <laughs> uh, wife Zipporah, <laughs> was Cushite. Uh, and, and, and his father-in-law, Jethro, now that sounds kind of soulful to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 her, her dad's name was Jethro, you know. He taught Moses how to, you know, supervise without, without wearing himself out. And so it's good. You find some ethnicity in the Bible. Uh, did you know Simon of Serene was a black man? Mark 15, 21 says, They pressed in the service a certain Cyrenian by the name of Simon that carried a cross of Jesus, parentheses, the father of Alexander and Rufus. How many black folk, you know, how many white folk, you know, by the name of Rufus? <laughs> Usually when I say that in church, I'll use that in church and Usually, some white guy will come up to me afterward and say, I got an uncle whose name is Rufus. <laughs> you, you know what I say to him? You better check your roots, man. <laughs> <laughs> this issue of, of mixed marriages is an issue in the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, I think Numbers 12, you know, you, you know what God did to Aaron and Miriam? Says so anger burned against them, and Miriam became leprous. Now, here's what theologians will say. Well, it wasn't about race. It was about the preeminence in the relationship with God. It was about the preeminence of the relationship. They were murmuring because uh, God showed more favor to Moses. He spoke to Moses face to face. They were. But what did they use to express their envy and jealousy? They used racism. They murmured against his Cushite wife. So when God responded, this is what God says. I don't think God is saying, I now recommend cross-racial marriage. That's not what he's saying. But he says that if two people love me and they respond to me uh, and, 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 and they're drawn together and they have my blessing, that's what it's all about. Don't murmur against it. I, I think that's the heart of God. Time for one last question, a real sticky one. A real sticky one. Come on now, who's got that real sticky one? Yes. Uh, you mean uh, you, 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 they, they are they are they are building dormitories, certain halls, and they're designated. This is the black floor. This is the Hispanic floor. There's something like that. <laughs> um, I, I am. I, I I would not. You want to say something before I answer? Oh, I see. I see. Um, hmm. I think that there is, is, is value and probably a great measure of necessity in having some, some things uh, that, that represent you and your ethnicity. I think there's value for the university to support that uh, because I think um, uh, that, uh, that, that universities, churches uh, ought to not just celebrate Black History Month, <laughs> uh, but I think there should be a time in which you celebrate each of the ethnic races. Now, I think if you try to do it ethnically, there's so many different ethnics, you'd never be able to do it. But the way I would do it is in major racial grouping. 
Asian, Hispanic, Latino, uh, African American, uh, Native American, uh, Messianic, uh, 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 a Jew. I, I would do it maybe in f uh, five major racial groups to cover that group. But to have something in which uh, they can be identified uh, with or, or, or their culture can be um, uh, expressed so that everyone can understand and partake of that, I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good I think it's biblical because in the Bible, um, you know, when you look at the genealogy of Mary and the, ge and the genealogy of Joseph, uh, you see, uh, it, there's not only an identity in Christ, but there's a biological identity that has measure. And so I think there's, there's value to doing that in a way uh, that, 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 it, that gives encouragement to that particular race or culture in a way that all should benefit from it. So it should be done in a way that it's mutually benefiting to all. See, I think the, the, that the black man is made in the image of God. I think that the Hispanic Latino is made in the image of God. I think that the Asian is made in the image of God. I think that the Native American is made in the image of God. The Messianic Jew obviously is made in the image of God. I think the Anglo is made in the image of God. Now, if each of these racial groups are made in the image of God, there's something unique about the image of God that is contained within the different racial groups. And so the more I know about the different racial groups, their idiosyncrasies and things about them, the more I know about the fullness of, of the character of God because we're each made in the image of God. And so if there is a unique race, this Asian... Boy, there's something Asian about God. There's something Latino about God. Uh, there's something soulful and African American about God. There's something Anglo about God. And so if, if we look at others and say, wow, this is a unique creation of God, and if I understand as much as I can about this uniqueness, I, I'm, I'm understanding something more about the uniqueness of God, our creator. And so for that reason, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's done. But I think it needs to be done with sensitivity so that, it's, so that it's diversity and inclusivity and it doesn't become something that separates, but it becomes something that, that exposes and, 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 and allows uh, people to, to understand more about uh, the different cultures. That be it.